My name is Molly Copeland, and I'm a, a student here in sociology at Duke. And today I'm going to talk mostly about whole network descriptives. So I'm going to start by blatantly copying Jimmy um, and putting whole network in quotes, like he did yesterday, because of course we don't ever have an actually whole network. Even if we think we have captured the network of a population, there's probably a lot of variety in relationships or different ties outside of the network boundary that we haven't seen. So when I'm talking about whole network, or you see that on the schedule, it's really just talking about sociocentric data as opposed to ego network data. Um, sometimes you might see it as sociometric as well, same thing. Um, but you still need to consider all of the sampling and boundary restrictions, um, all of those considerations that Jimmy was talking about yesterday. It just means that we generally have data on alters as well as these kind of isolated pockets of egos reporting on their alters. And before I dig in, I just want to give a special acknowledgement uh, both to Tom Valente's Social Networks and Health book, which is fabulous, especially at dealing with these basics, if uh, that's something that you want to dig into more, and uh, to Jim's lecture slides, which I've also borrowed from very heavily and are online if you need to check them out. So that's another place to get greater detail especially if you're, you're interested in kind of the graph theory and the math end. Um, so there are a lot of different ways that you could think about organizing a talk like this about whole networks. Um, so you could frame it as kind of a micro, meso, macro process. What's the micro process that's generating ties between individuals in the network? What's a meso process that's uh, characterizing subgroups? Or how could we describe a whole network? That's not necessarily the approach I'm going to take today, um, in particular because I think if you're transitioning from our typical data frame regression framework. I have cases, I have attributes that are features of cases, right? variables about people. Um, it's easier to start thinking about how the network descriptives apply in that kind of individual sense if you're coming from that uh, non-networks background. So to do that, I'm going to mainly be talking about centrality, connectivity and cohesion, and roles. And with centrality, um, focusing first on these individual nodes and thinking about what are the corollaries at the whole network level of those specific centrality measures and uh, taking a detour into structural holes for a little bit. So I know for most of you this is going to be review, right? This is stuff that uh, maybe it'll be a, a memory, kind of a, a reminder brought back from your own social network seminar in grad school. Um, and for some of you, it might not be enough detail, and it might just be kind of getting started. So to that end, please feel free, in, you know, in particular, to ask questions, to uh, have suggestions. Particularly, we have such a variety of fields in the audience that you might know of a resource that really speaks to your subfield, that speaks to epidemiology or HIV testing or things like that in a way that would be useful for the people around you, and it's something I don't know about. So please feel free to chime in at any time. Um, I study adolescence and mental health, so most of your examples are going to be adolescence and mental health or something related to that uh, as we go. So starting with centrality, this is just asking, how would we distinguish who is an important actor in the network? Who is really at the center of a network? And it seems like a very straightforward question, but what, oops, sorry, going backwards. But what we mean by center can get very complicated very quickly. And how you define what important would be for a particular network could actually have a lot of complicated variation. And in fact, it can get so complicated that uh, courtesy of the internet, there's this fabulous periodic table of centrality. So hat tip to David, I guess, Scotch or Scotch, I don't know him, but he has a great website. And he spent a lot of time making this visual of all these different centrality measures and their citations. So this could give you a sense of just how many different measures you could be measuring with your network. And, and uh, this is motivating my disclaimer for the talk that I will not be talking about all of them. So we're going to be talking about main groups and families, but before you go out and make your own centrality measure because you can't find the one you want, you should look very carefully because there's a good chance that somebody has made it. Right? So how would we distinguish important actors? Now that can seem very easy if you have a graph like this one here. Um, on the left, where there's clearly a hub structure, right, and a, an actor in the middle of the network, but it might not be as easy if you're looking at the middle graph, right, where we, we have kind of uh, different components who are being bridged by a few individuals, or if we have a circle or a line graph. It's harder to say who is a central or important actor because of the variation that we can see in network structure. And so some of the background of what makes a centrality measure a centrality measure, if we're not going to list and describe the pros and cons of every single one of them. So Freeman really kicked this off in the social sciences, I would say, in 1979, with a paper where he talked about degree, closeness, and betweenness. 
And those have kind of been the popular three main themes um, in centrality that uh, we're going to talk about today as well. But he also gives us this clear criteria for what a centrality measure ought to include. So it's something that you could calculate on individuals in the network, something that you could then normalize so you could compare across networks of different size, and something where you could derive a network level corollary, so some centralization counterpart that captures the distribution of individuals in that network on that particular centrality measure. And another step to think uh, before you're choosing a particular measure, another step that you have to take is, um, as Bria did a great job of discussing yesterday, you can always measure whatever you want in terms of there's never like one exact thing that is the measure bar none that you have to be doing. It completely depends on the theory and mechanism motivating your research question. Right? So you really have to put in the conceptual work first of what is my network representing? What are the mechanisms that I think are at work that are motivating these questions? What's flowing through my network? Right? And a great example of why this might matter comes from Borgatti's paper in 2005 when he lays out this very nice uh, typology of what could be flowing through the network in what ways. So um, a geodesic is the shortest possible path. A path would be a sequence with no edge or node repeated. Right? A trail is a sequence where you don't repeat edges. And a walk is unrestricted. You could repeat back through the network through the same nodes or edges. So that just gives you a sense of the way that something could move through the network. Right? It could also kind of be sequentially duplicated. It could be one bit that's being transferred that's moving along through the network. And just if we, we take into consideration those two parameters of flow, you could see all of the different examples of pieces that move through a network differently and might lead to measures that you wouldn't want to necessarily conflate or be measuring one or the other. So for example, if we talk about package delivery, if I order something off Amazon, it goes from the Amazon warehouse to my local post office to my door. One piece is kind of getting delivered directly through the shortest path possible. Path possible. If it isn't, I get pretty annoyed because it hasn't shown up in time. And I'm like, what's my package doing in Michigan still? Right? You know? So you're expecting that direct transfer in the shortest way possible of one piece. That's very different from something like gossip. Right? Where you're not necessarily taking the shortest path. There might be certain nodes you're avoiding, right? if they're the subject of the gossip. Um, it could be repeated through edges. So if I tell a rumor to Maria Cristina and she tells Joe, and then Joe tells me the next day because he doesn't know I'm the one who started it, right? Like we might have some, some kind of duplication there. Um, you could be telling multiple people at once. right? So you could have very different kinds of flow uh, conceptually if you have the same network process. So you really have to dig into that theory about what are the mechanisms at work that I need to be considering when I'm thinking about centrality in my network, because that's really going to inform what the best measures would be for you to use. So I want to introduce you to my running example through most of this talk. So this is an, one of our faux ad health networks. Um, and I've reduced it so it's just kind of a subset of what you'll be working with in the lab today. This is just students who are in seventh and eighth grade. Um, I'm keeping it kind of very simple, just so we have this kind of example throughout when we're talking about degree, what would degree look like in a sociocentric network? What would uh, betweenness look like? And so these are uh, adolescents who nominated their five male friends or five female friends, up to five in both case. So some of the main ways that uh, we've answered this question of how, how do we distinguish an important actor through centrality measures. Um, today we're going to talk about degree, closeness, betweenness, and a little bit about information and power. But again, there are many different ways that you could measure this, so you really have to kind of start with these conceptual steps of what you want to be measuring first. So I'm sure everyone is familiar with degree, right? That's the number of ties for a particular node um, in an undirected sense. There's a lot of different types of notation, so just a few of them are thrown down there. Um, I'm not going to dig too much into the math throughout this talk because I think most of the time we're typing degree in R. We're not calculating it by hand anymore. But, so it's there if it's something that will help you kind of learn or if you need to adapt it later as a reference, but um, I'm not going to be focusing on that today. Uh, just a remem uh, reminder, as Jimmy was talking about yesterday with network data collection, uh, degree is sensitive to your instrument, right? So if you're asking people to name up to five people, it's going to be truncated. And you might be prompting people to name five when they might have you know, not thought they would have any male friends, for example, or whichever, whichever way. So if we size our nodes by degree in our running example, as you might expect, there are a few people who are a little more popular than the others with about 15 degrees. We have a lot of people on the fringe that have 
one degree, so they were named as a friend once. Of course, if you have data that can be directed, so you have something like friendship nominations where it's sent in a direction, right? This is different than if you have something like a kind of co-citation or um, co-attendance at a meeting where it can't really be directed. Either you were both there or you weren't, right? Um, you could distinguish between sent and received ties, and uh, your in-degree and out-degree should balance for your entire network, right? Because if everybody is sending to someone, the total of how many were sent should be the same as how many were received in total, but it could be different for individuals. So you could be somebody who's saying, I have 10 friends, and two people said they're your friend, right? You might not necessarily balance. Um, isolates are a special case that you want to, one, make sure you're not excluding accidentally in your data construction, but two, that you're kind of thinking about, well, how might these processes apply or not apply in a special way to these isolates who are not connected to others? So who we know are part of this population, who have been surveyed or um, otherwise accounted for, but they're not connected um, here. And then why might degree centrality matter? Uh, oh, sorry, I'm trying to scroll for notes and it's... Take me away. There we go. Um, when, especially when you're thinking about kind of the difference between in and out degree centrality. So uh, thinking of adolescent friendships, like in this ad health example, um, in degree is typically characterized as popularity, and you could think of the kind of that that might um, be particularly influential peers. So it might be people who are setting norms in this setting. They might be receiving aspirational ties from other people who you know, are trying to signal that they're their friend. So out to degrees could be those aspirational ties or it could be expansiveness or gregariousness, right? People who are kind of um, aspiring to be part of the, the social system that we're seeing here or the, the social space of the school in the ad health case. Um, but we can connect it to particular mechanisms as well, right? So you might be um, receiving more social support if there are more people, right, with, uh, if you have a higher in degree. You might be providing more social support if you have a higher out degree or something like that. Isolates might be excluded uh, in ways that could be negative for mental health, but they also might be protected from some kinds of transmission, right? And as Bria said yesterday, um, you can't always assume that more is better until you know if you're talking about more of what. Right? So depending on what's flowing through the network, it, it might be great to be popular until you, know, you have a lot of access to substances to abuse or something like that. Um, so it's important to think about the ways that in-degree and out-degree could be uh, different in ways that are conceptually meaningful. So just to give you kind of one example that you could follow up with later if you're interested in seeing um, some uh, health studies that have kind of done this uh, well or in a, a very clear and useful way. Um, one study from 2013, they test uh, cortisol levels as an indicator of stress for, and they have friendship network data, for, I think for nursing students. Um, and they find there's an association between stress and your out degree in particular. So you have higher cortisol if you have lower out degree. So it's greater stress if you are not sending ties into your network. And it's kind of an important distinction between in degree and out degree in this study. So there, there's a lot of ways that degree has been used very thoughtfully and effectively in a lot of social networks and health studies in particular. But there's always a but. Right. It's purely a local measure. So degree can be quite deceiving because it's telling you just about the local environment of a particular node and it might miss some of the more interesting structural patterns throughout the network as a whole. So in this little toy example here, we might you know, get a printout of node degrees and see, uh, pay all attention to all the highest degrees and lowest degrees and completely ignore this person who has a degree of three, but they're really playing a pivotal role of connecting this graph, right? So um, for questions that conceptually need to have uh, the larger network structure take into account, you need a measure that can actually account for that. So to come back to our toy example, here the nodes are sized by in degree, and um, the, we could have these two kind of lighter blue nodes, and they both have an in degree of two, but we can see that they're in very structural very different structural positions, right? So you would have this person who hasn't sent any out degrees, is kind of on the fringe of a network here, versus somebody who only has the same in degree, it might look the same on paper for this measure, um, but they're kind of also sending out degrees that are connecting them to others that have connections in the network. So it might be a slightly more embedded position. So just kind of a, a reminder that Degree is very useful, it's kind of a, a first step, but um, it's often a last step for a lot of studies in a way that you know, should be cautionary. 
So another measure uh, that's been very popular when considering centrality measures and social networks and health is closeness. And this is the idea that actors are important if they have less distance to all others in the network. So we calculate this by taking the inverse of the distance to every other actor. So the distance is the geodesic, the shortest path between two actors. And that, uh, so note that that's only measurable if the graph is connected. So uh, you can't have distance, you can't measure the geodesic if you're an isolate because the distance is zero or infinity. And in fact, we'll see in a second, that's one of the major buts about closeness is that it gets very tricky when you have disconnected components or isolates. Um, so you can only really measure closeness within the reachable section of a graph. And so you take the inverse of the sum of the distances from the actor to all other actors. Uh, it's usually normalized by the graph size um, so that you're not uh, just measuring volume or messing up your measurements because of volume. So you can um, <clears throat> get a number that ranges between zero and one. So just in our toy examples here, so this node, the central hub here, can reach everybody else in one step. So we see that their uh, adjacency matrix right, has a step of one. Everybody else, it's two steps because they have to go through that central node. So then if we um, take the, the inverse of the sum of the distances and then we normalize by graph size, this is what's happening in the nuts and bolts under the hood when you're typing closeness into R right, on a much larger, fancier network. Oh, so this is closeness measured in our toy example again. So you see it, it looks fairly similar to degree, um, but these individuals that are included in our network because they were named by someone, but they themselves didn't have any other connections into the network and they didn't send any out degrees. Um, they are kind of non-existent. So they would have a closeness of zero because they, they themselves can't reach into the graph because they didn't have any out degrees. So there's, this is a plot of the correlation between closeness and degree just in this graph. And you can see that it's generally correlated, but it's not exactly the same. It's, it, there's a little bit of kind of fuzziness around that pattern. And it's also thrown off by the individuals who were named a lot but didn't name anyone themselves. Right, they have a closeness of zero, but their degree could be higher because of their in degree. So just like degree, you can have uh, closeness measured in a directed fashion, but uh, it's, you get a nonlinear distortion if you're taking the inverse in a way that can be um, misleading a little bit for some of your measures in your data. And there's different solutions to what you do for disconnected nodes. So is the closeness of an isolate infinity? Right? And then I think that's what UCI Net and NetDraw do, right? Or um, sometimes it's the longest distance observed in the graph plus one. Sometimes it's the size of the graph. So people have kind of made up different, you know, just no like ad hoc, no rhyme or reason solutions for what you do when closeness doesn't work for these certain individuals. Um, and this is the probably my, my favorite cautionary tale of this whole presentation. Um, sometimes it's measured in different ways, in ways that aren't necessarily transparent under the hood in R. So for example, StatNet takes the inverse of the distances to all others. So if you have a higher value in StatNet, it means that node is more close to the others, right? iGraph does not take the inverse, right? They, they come from this crazy computer science engineering background for iGraph, so they're not thinking the same way as the sociologists. And so if you have a higher number for closeness in iGraph, it means there's actually more distance to others. Um, so you might be, you know, going away. I think I made this mistake last week, actually, in iGraph. You're like plugging away and your numbers, all of a sudden, one of them looks really backwards. And it's kind of confusing or, you know, maybe you don't necessarily notice that. And that's because it's actually calculating it in a completely different way. And it's not, you know, sending you a message like, hey, by the way, this is the formula for closeness. It's just doing it and expecting that you know what that is. And this measure, for some reason in particular, tends to be very different across different um, programs like that. So because of that, I, I think it's safe to say closeness has a little bit fallen out of favor, um, but the idea of it is very intuitive and could be very important for your research question. So the last major centrality measure to talk about is uh, betweenness. So of these, it's the last of these kind of top three that Freeman has outlined and people have been using heavily since 1979. Um, so this is thinking about the importance of an actor based on how they could control information flow in the network or if they're bridging different parts of the network or relatively disconnected uh, other nodes in the network. So it counts the number of paths, the, these geodesics where actor J is on the, the shortest path or geodesic between actors I and K. So how much are they kind of controlling that shortest path between two other actors? <clears throat> 
So it's a, a bit of a strategic structural position that's asking who is a central bridge or connector here, or in Freeman's terms, a gatekeeper. Um, there's an excellent example of this from a, a JAMA article that's actually looking at two mode network data um, with physicians who share patients, but they have great visualizations of betweenness and a lot of the other uh, measures that could be helpful if you're looking in, in this kind of medical world. Um, and the, they actually find that specialists have higher betweenness in rural areas, but not in urban areas within their data. So I think they look at like Boston and North Dakota, um, and they find some, some differences kind of that they can connect to theoretical reasons for why you know, standards of care might be different or, or care received might be different based on the, the kind of connections and locations of specialists uh, amongst physicians who are working with the same patients. So if we look at our little toy ad health example here, um, you'll notice that some of those kind of important gatekeepers who are maybe connecting parts of the network have exploded in terms of their betweenness level, right? If we size the nodes according to betweenness, um, and some of the people who were very popular before, most of their ties are redundant. So they might have very high degrees, um, but they are actually relatively low in betweenness. But betweenness is probably too strict, problematically restrictive, in the sense that a lot of things can flow and not necessarily take the shortest path. So you might want to be measuring individuals and how they're um, on the path that connects other nodes in the network, but not necessarily the shortest path possible. And information centrality is doing exactly that. So it's measuring flow, but not on the geodesic. So you could think of ways that um, social norms or peer influence or um, the flu might be spreading and not necessarily only on the geodesic. So just as an example here with these little toy data sets, um, you can of course have different combinations of these centrality measures in ways that are informative about that individual node's position. So you can have a low degree high betweenness for a node, which is few ties that are crucial to the network flow as we kind of have that, that um, you know, very basic example of, of why degree might not be as informative as possible. And you can also have a high degree and low betweenness. So an individual who has many ties, but they're mostly redundant. They're tied to people who are also tied to everyone else. And in our small little example network here, we can have the side by side of in degree and betweenness. And again, you'll see that the individuals who are really bridging different parts of the network have much higher betweenness values. Um, and it really just depends on what question you're asking, which mechanism you think is best captured for the process at hand in your network. So in fact, if we look at kind of these main um, centrality measures, this is just the top 10 nodes out of that toy ad health network, um, you can see that they're generally related, but they're certainly not equivalent, right? So we have some kids who are very expansive, but not very popular. Um, we have others that have uh, you know, high, fairly high degrees, like individual number four here, but they, their ties are redundant. They're not necessarily connecting everyone. Um, and individuals who have high bridging, even though they're not the most popular uh, in the set. And if we look at the correlations between the measures, um, you can see that in general things are you know, positive and moving in the right direction, but it's not necessarily, um, they're not equivalent. So it, they are measuring very distinct things. And so that's, again, just very important to think about the kind of theoretical motivation for which one's appropriate, right? And in fact, closeness here is, you can already see it's kind of causing trouble because um, we have so many individuals who have a higher degree but a closeness of zero. And in fact, if you have low correlations between your centrality measures, it's probably telling you something interesting and important about those nodes in the network, right? So you could think about individuals who are very popular, but they can't reach the rest of the network, right? So they have a high degree and low closeness. We know they're embedded, but maybe in this kind of distant little subgroup on the periphery of the network or individuals that are uh, very popular and they're popular amongst the most popular other people as well. So they are reaching everyone in the network, um, but they, oh, sorry, they don't have necessarily a lot of ties, but it's to the most important people in the network. So that would be low degree and high closeness. And you can see the rest of the kind of combinations there intuitively interpreted. So uh, another measure, uh, working with this idea of kind of, it might not just matter who you're tied to, but who those alters are also tied to as well. Brings us to the idea of power. So actors would be important or central if they're tied to other people who are important or central. So this is uh, commonly developed by Bonasich and written out as maybe Bonasich centrality, Bonasich power, sometimes called prestige. You, you have a lot of 
a lot of centrality measures that are basically measuring this um, that have a lot of different names. But the important thing about Bonasich power centrality is you have this beta tuning parameter. Um, and so the, the beta parameter allows you to give weight to how much you want to consider the uh, importance of other people's ties when you're measuring an individual node's Bonasich power centrality. So for example, if you have a very small beta, you're basically measuring degree. Right, if it gets to be zero. So you're saying that the most important thing is that individual nodes ties and we're not going to consider the ties of other people to a greater extent. If you have a very high beta, you're having a more kind of global value, right? So you're giving greater weight to the global structure. It's more like a reach or a kind of radius um, in that sense. You could also make beta positive or negative. So you could um, say that we have a higher centrality uh, value on this measure if you are tied to other central people who have a lot of central ties themselves. Or you could make it negative and say that you have a higher centrality measure if you're tied to individuals who are not necessarily central. And you can imagine ways that that would be important. You want to know who is popular kind of on this other peripheral group of the network that might not be accessed with the most central um, and maybe obvious way through a measure like closeness, right? So it's very useful to be able to kind of uh, tweak to some extent exactly uh, the exact measurement to get what you want through that beta parameter. Um, eigenvector centrality you might have heard of, it's almost the same thing except it doesn't have a beta. So you, you lose the benefit of that tuning and kind of making that choice. Um, and it's also only ought to be used with symmetric or undirected data. So you can do it in R with directed data, but mathematically it is not appropriate. So I don't recommend it. Um, so if we look at uh, Bonasic power here, um, you can see if you have a positive beta, of 0.5, uh, it's giving weight to individuals who are tied to other people who have a lot of ties. Right? And if it's a, a negative 0.5, it's giving weight to individuals who are tied to people um, who don't have a lot of out degrees into the network otherwise. So we get, can get a slightly different measurement just through that, that one power or that one measure of power. Um, I think most of the time people are just using it as positive or otherwise noting if they've done something to kind of tweak it, but that tends to be the default. Of course, there are many, many more measures if you think back to that uh, periodic table visualization. So there's a whole suite of peer influence measures from Friedkin. There's uh, the idea of the most important nodes in the network are the ones who break things apart if you take them out, right? So kind of getting at Borgatti's uh, key player suite of programs, removal centrality, right? Really thinking about the rest of the graph. Um, so there's certainly more out there to be had. Um, and I'm you know, not getting into the nitty gritty of analysis by any means, but uh, just uh, kind of to spit a bug in your ear for what you should be thinking about for the lab section. But you can definitely use multiple measures in analysis. So um, it is worth it to be choosing the strategically and theoretically according to your mechanisms and what makes sense conceptually. Um, but you, you're not restricted to only using one ever. And in fact, there's a lot of excellent papers that are looking at kind of different combinations of measures, which I'm sure you've seen. Um, but multicollinearity is definitely a concern. So you, just like Bria was talking about yesterday, you need to do kind of your, your smart diagnostic techniques to make sure that you're not using a measure that's measuring almost the exact same thing as another measure and kind of soaking up all of the variation in a way that really could um, mess with your modeling. Okay. So, uh, Rather than just thinking about the most important individual actors, you might want to describe the distribution of uh, that particular characteristic in the overall network. So to what extent is the power um, concentrated in a few individual nodes or spread throughout the network? And so each of these kind of centrality pieces we've talked about can be measured at the whole network level as centralization. So just like you have degree centrality, you can have the degree distribution. So the frequency distribution of degree values of actors. So a simple random graph, what we would expect by chance, has a Poisson distribution. So any variation from that would suggest some kind of non-random process. And if we look at the degree distribution of our little toy network here, you see what you normally see in a social network. No Poisson distribution, instead kind of more of the, the power law or gamma distribution here, um, that you have we have no isolates, so we're starting at one, there's no zero. But um, you have a lot of people with a few degrees. And then you have a few people with a lot of degrees, a few very popular people. And in fact, that's what you would typically find in a social network setting, this kind of distribution with the long tail. 
Um, and this can be very useful. So one of the kind of classic papers, uh, Morris and Crutchmer look at uh, simulating the spread of HIV and realize that you know, it could look like a very terrible HIV ac epidemic is on the way until you consider that the, the modal degree, uh, degree in the distribution is one, because most people are monogamous. Right? So you have to consider the way that the degree distribution could affect the epidemic potential um, given the, what's observed in the data, right? and in a way that we know is very powerful for what we would expect for an epidemic like that. You could have a centralization of any other measure in addition to degree. So you could look at the centralization of closeness, how is closeness spread throughout the network, right? Or, or other values. Um, and just looking at the dispersion of centrality in the graph as a whole or the, the lack of dispersion. If it's really a very hierarchical setting where centrality is concentrated in a few actors. Probably another popular measure, if not the most popular measure, um, for thinking about kind of this structure of the whole network is looking at density, right? And you heard about this yesterday in ego networks, and the kind of same principle applies in sociocentric networks, that it's the number of ties that exist given to what's possible. In general, in our network, every node is not connected to every other node, so we tend to have very low density values. That's normal in a kind of social network like this. Um, but it certainly can be useful, uh, especially if you're thinking about how the density of the entire sociocentric network might be shaping or interacting with some of the individual measures as well. So there's a paper um, in 2016 that looks at the contagion of friends depression in a high school network and finds that the effect of friends depression on ego actually depends on the density of the school network. So if you're in a very tight knit, very dense high school, it, you see a greater effect from having depressed friends. That's not the case in a low density network. So uh, some of those interactions like Bria was talking about yesterday, um, I think are very underutilized in the social networks and health literature and have a lot of potential. Okay, so we're going to kind of leave individual node centrality and centralization behind. Does anybody have any questions? Any other thoughts about, what about my favorite measure? What? No? Great, okay. Um, so beyond centrality, you might want to think about structural arrangements that could work in combination with attributes. So thinking of the similarity of attributes, um, typically we're talking about homophily. And again, I'm gonna buzz through this a little bit because you got such a, a great kind of conceptual take on it yesterday with ego networks. Um, and in sociocentric data, you could be thinking about kind of the assortative or disassortative mixing. And that could happen on attributes. So things like having um, the individuals kind of clustered according to the same gender or the same grade in middle school and high school or people in the same firm or same department, right, uh, through a map of kind of uh, university connections or something like that. But you could also think about the ways that um, the structural features lead to assortative or disassortative mixing, right? So popular kids might hang out with other popular kids more. So you could have kind of assortative mixing on degree. Um, you might also expect disassortative mixing. So if you have a, you know, a hetero heterosexual sexual relationship network, then you're going to be expecting disassortative mixing on gender right, or things like that. So you could kind of see examples of this, um, again, based on what you're measuring in your research question. And this is from purely a descriptive level at the moment, so not talking about how it got to be that way in terms of selection or influence, but just we can measure to what extent we observe this in our network. So in our toy example here, we could uh, color code based on grade. So green would be seventh grade and blue would be eighth grade here. And uh, males are triangles and females are squares in this data. Um, so you see some assortative mixing, not as much as I would have expected for junior high, right? Good job, kids. Right? Um, but we see some, some kind of clumps of green or blue and some kind of clumps of triangles or, or squares. And you can measure that in a, you know, to give a more technical description than just clump. Right, and, and kind of talking about the assortativity or disassortativity of the mixing in your network. Structural holes, um, same as in ego networks, they're kind of the absence of ties between alters, but they can have kind of a, a much broader sense of absence or connection because you have sociocentric data, right? So it's not just ego reporting on whether those alters know each other, you have many more layers of structure that you can kind of go out within the network. Um, so this links back to, you know, Granovetter strength of weak ties, kind of the triaclosure and those, those ideas that we discussed yesterday, a lot of it coming out of um, social networks and management or business from Ron Burt. Um, and 
usually what we're interested in is not so much the structural hole per se, but individuals who are bridging the structural hole. So are you connecting people who otherwise wouldn't be connected, or even connecting components of the network that wouldn't otherwise be connected? And we could think of how this might have a lot of returns in terms of you know, social capital or you know, information about getting a job. And Granovetter's classic example might matter for innovation. Um, it might matter for something like disease diffusion as well. Um, and it could also kind of be on the other side of the equation. So maybe it's not important just as a cause, but maybe being in that bridging position is actually giving you greater social skills because you're dealing with different groups of people. Um, and the way that this has been theorized to kind of uh, have a structure generating the importance of this position and connecting to mechanisms is the idea that uh, redundancy introduces constraint. Right? If your friends know each other, if, I always think of the example, if you live in a small town where like, if you do something, someone's going to call your mother and they're gonna, like, she's going to find out about it, right? that introduces constraint when there are all those other ties that can kind of uh, spread information of, about you or around you if they need to. And so you could get power brokerage from being able to control information or resources by bridging that structural hole. So even back to Zimmel's idea of the Tertius Gardens. Right? And I am hard pressed to find a very good social networks and health example using sociocentric data with this. So if anybody has any great examples, please don't be shy about raising a hand or you know, sending an email my way. There's an excellent paper that uses eco-network data uh, from Ben Cornwell that finds that spanning structural holes was significantly positively associated with better physical and mental health for older adults. So the idea that if you are interacting with kind of different groups of people, um, I, I think he, he finds that both you tend to have better health because if you have worse health, you um, reduce your ties kind of to the close tight-knit ties that know each other, but mental health, this cognitive boost from bridging that uh, structural hole is maintained. And so there's these four related measurements that go into kind of measuring this idea of uh, constraint and redundancy and the effective size of your network. Um, again, you, you went through this yesterday, so I'm not going to belabor it, and you'll get kind of the nuts and bolts in the lab later today um, about how to measure it. Sorry? <laughs> yep, I'll you no. Just kidding. It's going to be great. Um, so what are the, the structural arrangements or the characteristics that lead to individuals having these kind of specific positions of power, influence, or centrality. So if we're thinking about, OK, we've talked about how we could measure and describe who an important individual is. We can measure how that's distributed throughout the network. But what are really the kind of conditions and structures of the network that are, are leading to these positions in the first place? Um, and that can lead to thinking about connectivity and cohesion in the network. So thinking about patterns of connections between actors or the network structure beyond centrality. So the first basic step would be reciprocity, right? So if you have directed data, um, are your ties asymmetric or mutual? This is usually categorized with the dyad census, um, which goes in this man order, so mutual, asymmetric, or null. Um, it's usually called the man distribution. Um, and so you could measure the proportion of symmetric ties in your network or of the non-null ties, what proportion are reciprocal as well. So you could characterize a network by how often you're observing mutuality given the ties that exist in the network. Just like you would have the man distribution, you can bump it up from dyads to triads with the U-man distribution and the triad census. So this is the undirected uh, or sorry, the uniform graph distribution of the mutual asymmetric and null ties. And in the triad census, um, every time that you see this little three-digit number, that's corresponding to the, the mutual ties, the asymmetric ties, and the null ties in that triad. So we can characterize all of the possible configurations of a triad in a directed network. Um, and then it, some of them are the same in number. So they give you a letter as well. I think it's, I think it's just down, up, transitive, and cycle. Which seems kind of funny to me. That's like, oh, the up one or the down one, but that's what it is. Um, and so this, I think triads have been you know, an object of fascination for sociologists, kind of back to you know, Holland and Leinhardt and Zimmel and Granovetter, the idea that you know, that's when things start to get sociological, when it's not just a dyad, but it's a triad. And there, you know, there's two other people who could be talking about you. That's when, that's when the crazy stuff starts to happen. So um, there's been a, a a lot of attention paid to triads, in particular to transitivity. Right? So we could think about how 
what kinds of triads do we see in our triad census beyond the, what we would randomly expect uh, given chance, right? Or given just kind of the, the basic probabilities of the census. And with that, what's the likelihood that if I is connected to J and J is connected to K, that I is connected to K? Okay, so if we have these individuals and, and person I here knows person J and J knows K, then we're expecting that I probably knows K as well. So in directed triads, you could have intransitive or transitive or vacuous triads, right? Because if they're null, it's how do you say if you're, you know, like uh, on kind of in the same direction or not, if there's no tie there to be directed in the first place. So, um, but you could see a, a kind of a blend of mutual and asymmetric ties or in also introducing mixed triads. And so this leads a little bit into social balance theory, which I'm not really going to dig into here because it's not um, terribly structural, and I, don't, I also think it's uh, not very utilized in the health literature, but um, it's an important thing to have on your radar that, okay, we could have triads, we can have directed transitivity in triads, and then we can also have balance if those triads are valued in some way. So if you have positive or negative relationships. So we could see that you likely know the your alters alters, right? That's the idea of transitivity. If your friend is a friend with someone else, um, you probably know them. But if it's a positive tie like friendship, we expect that the tie would be positive as well for your relationship with your alters alters. So the friend of your friend is your friend, right? Um, similarly, if your friend hates that person, social balance would say you probably hate that person too. Okay, so the enemy of your friend is your enemy. Or if there is someone where you have a negative relationship, and of course I'm, I'm using these kind of you know, silly, like, oh, you hate someone and it's your enemy, but you could have any kind of valued system, right, and any kind of data with your vertices, and as long as there's a value to your edges, you could have, um, be thinking about balance, right? So your enemy's friend is probably also your enemy. And then the one that gets a little sociologically weirder is um, your enemy's enemy being your friend. I, I don't know that's necessarily true. You might have just more than one enemy or you might have an ambivalent relationship, right? But um, you could imagine that in kind of a game theoretic sense that you know, all, of the, all of the little victims might gang up on the bully one day or something. I don't know, but um, sorry? There you go. So you have to take it back to game theory or Machiavelli, I guess. Um, but the, this is kind of the social balance idea that if we, not only do we expect kind of these connections to exist through transitivity, but that if they are valued, we expect the, bal the values to balance as well. So if we look at our little toy example, we could calculate the dyad census. So we have 22 mutual ties, mostly null ties, because most people are not connected to everybody else in the network. Same with the triad census. So it, um, R will spit out these triad values. I've highlighted the transitive ones here. Um, you can count up your transitive triads. You'll notice that um, we don't see the distribution that we would expect uh, just given kind of the random chance of how the triads could be distributed. So we don't see any of the O3OC cycle, right? There's nobody who, a person A named person B, person B named person C, person C named person A, and they never like had a mutual tie amongst the three of them. That's not occurring naturally in our data. And you usually find a pattern like that. You tend to find a, in you know, social friendships a tendency towards transitivity and a, a prohibition against different kinds of cycles. Any questions? Dyads, triads, transitivity, any thoughts to share? Okay. Keep drinking the coffee, don't worry, we'll get there. All right. You can also measure the um, distribution of transitivity in the network. So uh, of, the, of the ties that exist, how many are closed triads? So where do we see transitivity? So if I is tied to J and J is tied to K, how often do we see that tie between J and K being closed? Or sorry, I and K being closed. Um, and so that, that's a very helpful coefficient because then you can compare across networks net of volume differences. So getting a little less local, looking away from these kind of micro processes happening at the dyad and triad level, um, what are some of the popular ways that we might be characterizing networks overall in terms of their cohesion? So one uh, popular idea is that of a scale-free network. So these would be networks that have a highly skewed degree distribution, which means you have a few very, very popular people and a lot of people with a very low degree. And so locally, this arises when you have hubs because of preferential attachment. So the idea that popular people just keep getting more and more popular, you're more likely, if you have a high in degree, to get more in degrees as well. Um, kind of sometimes it's called the Matthew effect, right? This rich get richer idea. So this mostly comes out of uh, Barabasi's work. 
and you see some in instances of it or kind of suggestion to it in some networks like the Colorado Springs Project 90 data, um, but it's pretty rare to have this kind of pure scale-free network in a social setting. Mostly there's limits due to timing or scheduling that, you know, you might be a very popular kid in your high school, but at some point there's a limit to how many friends you're going to have, even if you could name as many as you wanted in the survey just because you don't have the time of day to just keep collecting and collecting and collecting in degrees, right? So there, there's usually some kind of limitation in a social network imposed on this scale-free setting. Um, we call it scale-free because of the, the, you see that uneven degree distribution at any scale of the network, right? If it continued to grow, it would still hold that same distribution. So another one that's more common kind of sociologically is this small world phenomenon. So the idea of what is the probability that two nodes are connected. So Milgram in the 60s was asking, like, how many steps would it take to connect people uh, across the world or in the United States? So his classic experiment, it was um, getting people to mail a packet of information to a Boston stockbroker. And he sent uh, packets to people in Boston, to people in Nebraska, and to stockbrokers in Nebraska. And the idea was telling, you know, telling the respondents, get this to so-and-so, I forget the, the guy's name, I'm sure some man somewhere in Boston, um, but I get this to, to this guy in Boston. And you know, seeing what were the tactics, what were the um, you know, ways that people tried to accomplish that. And he found this kind of very you know, famous, now apocryphal six degrees of separation, that it took six steps um, to, uh, on average, to get that packet to its destination, right? So we kind of have this idea that we're now connected through very few steps or fewer than we would expect. And so you have this characterization of a small world graph as generally large decentralized networks um, with, that are typically very sparse but have these little clusters, right? So Duncan Watts calls this like the caveman world. We're all living in our own little caves and, you know, it's, it's a little silly but you could imagine like, okay, you have your co-workers, you have your old friends from high school, you have your kinship networks, right? And there might be a few connections between them but in generally we have these different dense pockets that are very loosely interconnected at a global level. Um, but Watts shows us that having very small local changes could have a very big effect on the structure or the you know, transmission potential in a small world network. Because the, so the small world network is also characterized by these small average path lengths, right, with our clusters um, and relatively large clusters. But it does not take very many shortcuts, as it were, so very many ties connecting clusters to have a dramatic effect on the capacity for transmission in the network or you know, other types of diffusion or characteristics of the network features. So in, even in these kind of small little caveman worlds, um, you get a dramatic reduction in the average path length with just a very few, what seems like a local or micro process of adding one or two ties, and it, it has this big global impact. So how else could we measure or characterize this kind of small worldliness or clumpiness of our network and the cohesion of our network? So a very popular option is the clustering coefficient. Um, you already saw that with transitivity. So that's typically measured in two ways as either the, the average uh, local density or the transitivity ratio. So of the total triads, how many of them are closed? Um, one great example of this in the health literature uh, comes from Ashton and co-authors. And uh, they're comparing two RDS networks of people who inject drugs in the Philippines. And they see that uh, one network had much, much higher clustering of shared needles amongst triads. And that uh, was associated with the timing of a much faster HIV and AIDS epidemic in these two cities and networks that were otherwise comparable. So as you might expect, you know, kind of having that higher clustering could really dramatically change the, the diffusion in the network. But measuring clustering and cohesion can get very complicated. Um, so if you're thinking about the extent to which networks or subgroups within your networks are kind of interconnected or sticky or resistant to disruption, uh, it can be very challenging to measure. So one way of thinking about it is, is connectedness maintained through just a few actors or are there multiple independent paths that don't rely on just a few nodes in the network? So if there are kind of multiple ways that you could get from person A to person B throughout your network, you could think of that as a more cohesive network. So this is uh, often shown as reachability. Um, sometimes you could see it not just as reachability, but like the two reach or something like that. Um, but are actors reachable in the network? Are there paths that connect them? 
um, and more paths that would link or relink actors in the network can increase the cohesiveness of the network or the ability of that network to hold together kind of resistant to disruption. And note that this isn't just density. It isn't just having ties in the first place. So these little networks could have, they have the exact same density, but um, just rewiring this one edge right, can make a dramatic effect on the uh, reachability of the network and the cohesion of the network, right? whether or not it has, any, it has reachability throughout the whole network or is disconnected into two components. So it's not just whether or not ties exist in general, it's really about the pattern and the structure of those ties. So in a, a larger example here, you could have the same value of, of ties, but the, the graph on the right, right has many more independent paths connecting the network and making it more cohesive. So this is kind of taking it a step further structurally than just looking at density. We could have strong and weak components. Components are the maximally connected subgraph. So in your entire sociocentric graph, do you have um, disconnected pieces which are connected to each other? where there's a path between every node. A cut point is the particular node whose removal disconnects the graph. So down here would be number four, because if we took them out, we would have two separate components. And the cut set would be the group of nodes that meet that condition, right, in your larger sociocentric network. So from that, if you kind of think of those steps of, all right, how do we define a network that is sticky, that is cohesive? Well, what would it take to make it not cohesive and to break it apart? Um, you can get kind of a formal definition of structural cohesion based on the minimum number of actors who, if they were removed, would disconnect the group. So cut points that, the cut set of points that are leading to different components being created. Or you could think about it in the uh, edgewise fashion, so the minimum number of independent paths linking each pair of actors in the group. So in our little ad health example here, all of the cut points are in light blue. Um, so it's, it's very easy to make R do this. That's the good news, right? We don't have to do any of that um, pen and paper work necessarily anymore. Um, you see that most of the cut points are cut points because they named one person who's otherwise disconnected, these kind of little pendants of the network. Um, but we have a few that have more connections kind of indicating they're doing some of this structural work of providing uh, the connections that are keeping the network together. Um, if you'll notice, these are the uh, individuals that also tend to have high betweenness. And I did, I have to confess, I did um, make the cardinal sin of not setting the seed when I made my visualizations. So if you'll notice, they, they rotated a little bit. Um, from here on out with the example. So let that be a lesson to you that if you're giving a presentation and want the exact same example every time, you need to remember to set the seed. Um, so sorry about that. What? What? Or you just the variance. There you go. OK, good, good. That, that makes me feel better. All right. Um, so you components might be very useful. You might be interested in thinking about the features of these components. And a lot of times when you have a big, dense, messy network, you end up looking at components or, or different types of components because that's what's um, informative and manageable. So you could have K components as um, the subset of actors who are linked by multiple node independent paths. So typically you see a bi component, right? So connect actors who are connected by two independent paths, it's kind of a, a little more cohesive. We might think it's more tight knit than just the component in general where it only takes one path. That's a bit of a tighter restriction. Um, so every member mathematically must have at least k ties, right? But um, if they, they can't overlap too much because then it would, they would be in the two k components can't overlap because then it would be the same component, right? But you could think about how components could also be nested, so components and bi components. Or, you know, it could go on if you're having more levels of cohesion beyond just two independent paths. And components can also be very important for ego networks, right? So if, if you're talking about um, Ego could report alters who know each other, but if everybody doesn't know each other, you have components in the same way that you could in sociocentric data. When you have the sociocentric data, you can pay a little bit more attention to this nestedness of how cohesive groups are uh, nested within each other, just like little you know, Russian dolls where you can kind of drill down into smaller and smaller groups. Um, so embeddedness from Moody and White would be the idea that you could identify these cohesive groups in a network and then you can remove the K cut sets to get successively deeper embeddedness. So if you look at this first of, okay, in these groups of the network, if I remove one tie from each node, who is going to be disconnected and kind of kicked out of the network? 
Who gets disconnected if I'm removing two of their ties, right, et cetera? And with that, you could see how these components of embeddedness, how these, sorry, I shouldn't use components colloquially, but how these different groups um, get kind of nested in successively deeper levels of embeddedness. So for example, person 20 down here, they have connections to their local neighbors, right, in this group with the black dashed line, but then they're also connected to this larger group that has connections here through nodes five and seven, right, shown in the kind of darker dashed line, and then through node seven, they also connect to this group over here. So they're nested within this larger group, this group on the left side, and then this group kind of in the lower quadrant. Um, and this is pretty computationally intensive and pretty underutilized in the health literature in general. But it, it's getting at this idea of the structural embeddedness, uh, the pattern of ties, and the nestedness of structures in the network beyond just density and volume. In addition to components, you can have kind of more um, restrictive substructures in the network. So you could have cliques or cliques. Uh, these are all members that are connected to all other members in that particular group. That's a, a pretty strong definition. So you have um, a lot of uh, relaxations of it that might be kind of socially meaningful or meaningful for your research question. So you could have a, a two-click where it's everybody who's connected within at least two steps. And that's, you can make that an n-click. So if you want to make it you know, who's connected within three steps or seven steps or whatever you think is important and interesting. You could have a k-plex, where every member is connected to at least um, n minus k others in the graph. These become pretty intractable if you have a large network. So um, it, it's pretty challenging to have kind of these restrictive definitions. Most of the time we're, we're talking about components, but um, I will say that you, you also see people using clicks or clicks kind of colloquially without this strict definition. So that's just something to keep in mind um, that sometimes it gets kind of misused and abused as any kind of group or clumpiness in the network. And that um, isn't necessarily this technical kind of formal definition you would find in your Wasserman and Faust. So you could have clans as well. So members who are connected at distance n or less, but only through other members of that network. So it's, it's just another way of defining what groups are kind of connected in this network. Probably the most common that you would see in the literature would be a K-core. So if you have cliques and clans and plexes and K-cores, um, K-cores tend to turn up. So it's members that were joined to at least K other members in that group, even if they're not connected to everybody. So in our little toy network here, you, um, I've color coded based on the K-core level and you see we have ones, twos, and threes. So there's individuals who only have one connection in the network here in green, those who are connected to two people who are also connected to two others, and then we have kind of this um, small group, which I've expanded here, of the, the third K-core. So individuals who are, not only do they have three connections, but they have three connections to p other people who have three connections. So it's kind of getting at this extra level of stickiness that we're not capturing just with degree. Any questions? How about we take a five minute break to breathe and coffee, and then there we are Almost done. I really have only 10 slides left, so um, take a little stretch break and then we'll, we'll get back into it and finish up. So um, just a reminder that this is you know, the equivalent of three lectures getting squished into one hour and a half, hour 45 minutes here. So uh, you really are getting just kind of a skim of the surface of a lot of these topics, but that's also the goal to be able to kind of uh, put these things on your radar so that if they're new to you, you can figure out what is useful for you to follow up on, um, maybe give you a sense of some of the questions that are useful for you to ask, um, or again, to serve as a reminder of, you know, if you're like me and you have kind of circle around yearly to this presentation, you're like, oh yeah, that exists. I should do something with that, right? So um, that's kind of one of the goals. So uh, before we dig in, anybody have any questions that came over to them over the break or you got more coffee and you're feeling bold now and you're gonna raise your hand? No, you're doing good. Okay, so the last piece I wanna talk about would be um, thinking about characterizing our network or the importance of certain actors, the similarity of certain actors according to roles and positions. And uh, today I'm just going to really talk about structural equivalence with that. Um, so thinking about roles and positions, you got a, a good taste of this with Jim's intro to networks on Monday, but uh, the measures that describe subsets of actors or nodes who have similarly structured relations, right? So we might expect different kinds of behaviors or risks for actors based on the positions that they occupy and uh, we could draw similarities from them for individuals who are occupying similar positions. So this is the, the 
ugly version of the thing that Jim showed you on Monday, right? If you imagine this tie is a romantic attachment and these ties are you know, providing for and support attachments and these ties are fighting attachments, this would be our little family according to a, a structural graph. Um, or you could imagine mapping out a, a business arrangement with a boss and managers and employees. So thinking about kind of roles according to structure as we can observe in the network. So structural equivalence formally says that actors are equivalent if they have the same ties to the exact same people in the network. So that's a pretty strict definition because most of the time we don't have that many nodes who are tied to the exact same people in the exact same way. So it's, it's pretty rare and most of the time when you see structural equivalence used in the literature now, especially in empirical work and not kind of purely networks, graph theory, theoretical work, um, it's really talking about the relaxed version of regular equivalence. So actors are equivalent if they have ties to the same types of alters, but they don't necessarily have to be the exact same nodes or the exact same people in that sense. Um, so conceptually, this is a kind of what's stemming out of you know, the idea of anthropology, mapping out kinship networks or something like that. And it's a very untapped way of generalizing these multiple relation networks. Um, so the, you, know, you could think about it in a kinship example, just intuitively, like at least in you know, kind of American English, your cousin is your cousin. And they're your cousin because of the position they hold, not necessarily because of the person they are. Right, so you have a cousin who might be your uh, mother's brother's son, and you have a cousin who might be your father's sister's daughter. Right, but they're both your cousin. It doesn't necessarily matter the exact nodes that the relationship went through. It's based on the structure of the relationship. So if we're thinking about structural equivalence, and we take kind of this um, toy example here, of, you know, some kind of management situation, um, we'd have a structural equivalence between C and D and between E and F because they are connected to the exact same people. So that formal, tough definition of structural equivalence. We would have structural equivalence between G through J and K through N because they are both tied to C and D or E and F in that sense. So they have the same patterns of ties to the exact same actors. But we would have regular equivalence, that relaxed definition of equivalence between A and B because they have the exact same patterns of ties. Note, this doesn't just mean their out degree is two, or their degree is two. It's that the people they are connected to also have the same patterns of ties, right? And we would have that relaxed, regular equivalence between C through F, because they have the exact same patterns of ties, even though it's to different people. And you see the, the exact same thing on the bottom. So those two groups are regularly equivalent, even though they're not structurally equivalent. And the process of identifying these similar positions, these groups of people that are sharing the same position or role is called block modeling. And that comes from, if you picture the adjacency matrix of situating different kind of blocks of similar people, um, I think that's where the name came from. So you could do block modeling based on attributes on something based like gender, or typically it's done based on the patterns of ties. And this could be kind of increasingly abstracted or generalized. So a lot of time you hear people talking about core periphery arrangements that could be kind of a, seen as a type of block modeling. So the block model, if you back this out to an adjacency matrix and block model it, you really come up with three distinct positions, right? One, two, and three. So this would be position one, right? And it's tied, there's a tie within position one. So we get these little self loops here, right? Position two. And then position three has no self loops because they are not tied to each other. So we could take all of the information of this graph and what we're really interested in is what are the types of positions that people could be in in this network. You can reduce it to these three nodes in a block model like that. Um, I'm going to gleefully punt the rest of the discussion of block modeling to community detection in Peter Mucha. So uh, you'll, get, you'll get the goods on that later. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> so you know everything you need to. Great. No. Yes. So is, is equivalence um, like a categorical distinction, like these people are in the network are, are, have regular equivalence or not, or is it sort of a continuous like, you know, these people well, have, have similar patterns, but maybe not the same pattern. It's like a range. So, so yes, in both senses, um, because there are Sorry, let me go backwards. Um, because there are different relaxations. Oh, I'm going to have to go backwards so far. OK. Because there are different relaxations of equivalence. So if you were talking about 
this very strict definition, then actors either are or they aren't kind of in that group or equivalent with each other, right? But we can have all different kinds of relaxations that do provide this continuum, right? So you, it's a yes, no answer if a given pair of actors are structurally equivalent, but um, if we think about relaxing that to more of the block model perspective of what are kind of the types of relationships that even if you're not connected to the same people, you know, have the same types of ties, and there, there's further relaxations from there beyond regular equivalence that I just haven't delved into today that can get to that. So, you know, most of the time in, in social network data, you know, it might be a little different if you have something like co-occurrence in text or something that's a, a little more kind of formal like that. But um, in social network data, this is so strict that it doesn't become that informative because you probably know anyway if people are tied to the exact same people in the exact same way, right? And we really become more interested in kind of these fuzzier types of equivalence, um, which, you know, they still might have the yes, no answer within themselves, but you kind of get to the continuum by relaxing the definition. Does that answer? Okay. Any other questions on this? This is, again, a very shallow, brief introduction to a very complicated topic. So, okay. One of the nice differences between structural equivalence and regular equivalence, just to reinforce what Molly was saying, is that regular equivalence, um, uh, structural equivalence is tied to the, key, the actual identities of the people you're connected to. So it also tends to be, um, even the real, uh, we sort of measure the structural equivalence, end up being communities, end up being collections of people who are tied to each other. Whereas regular equivalents are people who have the same pattern of ties. So, so if you were to compare them on any set of summary statistics, of like centrality scores or something like that that Molly talked about at the beginning, they might have the exact same distribution of those centrality scores and never be connected to each other. And so it really makes this, this distinction between who you're connected to and how you're connected to. Great, and you can see that in this graph as well. So you have the idea that, you know, you have a sense of how E and F were connected in the first place. So their structural equivalence is not that informative, you know, it, and in the larger sociocentric graph, just to repeat what Jim said here, it, it's basically showing you communities loosely. But um, being able to say that C and E or, you know, C and F are in the exact same type of position, even though they're not connected to each other in the network is kind of more informative about the the certain you know, risks or benefits or characteristics of that structural position in particular. So the, the only and best example I could find of this um, talks about structural equivalence, but is really using regular equivalence. Uh, and this is in the, the health literature again. And so it, it's saying that um, actors are equivalent if they have the same ties to the same types of alters, but not the exact same people. So getting at this kind of role position definition again. Um, and this comes from Fujimoto and Tom Valente. And they actually look at uh, substance use in a high school. And they compare structural equivalence to other centrality measures that we might typically use, like popularity or expansiveness or um, your you know, betweenness. I, I don't remember the exact measure, but a whole host of centrality measures. And they find that um, exposure to substance use, so having alters who are drinking or smoking uh, through structural equivalence was actually a better predictor of drinking and smoking behavior than centrality. So the idea that uh, being connected to the same types of peers, so being connected to people with the same patterns of connections in the network actually told you more about who was going to start using substances at a later date than just kind of looking at who was popular or these more traditional measures. So it's kind of a, an interesting application of this you know, very formal theoretic idea about how it might matter in kind of a messy real world, real world setting. Okay, any questions on equivalence? So we're going to just wrap things up here. Okay. So in summary, there are so many ways you could be describing characteristics of networks or describing the networks overall or particular nodes of interest within them. Um, so we've talked about some individual properties of nodes or the uh, counterparts of those properties to characterize an entire network or describe the distribution of those features in the entire network, talked about uh, whole network structures and subgraphs. So centrality and connectivity and roles. Um, I just want to reiterate that, you know, it might be useful for you to think about this as kind of a micro, meso, macro process, especially now if you're, you know, being more 
uh, being familiar with the ideas or having been introduced to the ideas. So you could think about the processes kind of of the importance of individual nodes or dyad and triadic processes that are then leading to subgroups or kind of these subgraph structures or maybe roles that we could characterize across people in the network who aren't even connected to each other but are in the same kinds of positions and then up to features in the entire network. So I want to finish with just a reminder of all the things I haven't even begun to talk about right, in this entire time. So we haven't even talked about time, about dynamics. All of this is changing over time. So you have the effects of that change in particular, or you measuring and characterizing the churn and stability over time. So this hasn't even dabbled into dynamics or any kind of longitudinal data. Haven't really talked about two mode networks at all either, or aside from just one example. Um, and just a, a cautionary note that you know some of these centrality measures need to be interpreted differently or with caution with two mode network data. Um, if you're working with the one mode projection of two mode data, because you know just by that process, you have introduced you know, certain kind of expectations for density or degree that aren't necessarily comparable to one mode data. Um, and there, there's kind of always more depth to be had within even what we see today. So centrality or different structural measures specific to certain topics or processes. Um, Jim reminded me at the, at the break to tell you that you've all used eigenvector centrality today. Right. How do you know how? I didn't either when he told me to remind you, so don't feel bad. PageRank on Google is basically eigenvector centrality. So if you've Googled anything today, you've used your eigenvector centrality. So that's another centrality measure um, that we haven't even you know, started to talk about that has a lot of properties similar to what we have. So hopefully it's provided a good foundation for that. Um, and there's certainly more to come in terms of groups and community detection. And then this afternoon, tomorrow, you'll get all the details about kind of how to practically do this with messy data and how to, to make sense of it. Um, in, in a more kind of causal situation or setting. Any questions? All right, thank you very much.